I'm Charlie Coker, Executive Director of Asia Society of Southern California. I'd like to welcome you to our program, COVID-19 Vaccine Rollout. Um, we're very proud this evening to be uh, co-partnering on this program with our colleagues from Hong Kong, our Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Um, this evening, uh, uh, Ronnie Chan, Chairman of Asia Society Hong Kong and for, former Global Trustee Co-Chair, uh, will be giving a few introductory remarks. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Ronnie Chan. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Ronnie Chan. I'm the chairman of the A Society Hong Kong Center. This is the 28th episode that the A Society Hong Kong Center have brought to the world on this topic of the coronavirus. We started 13 months ago. I'm very happy that we are collaborating this time with the A Society Southern California Center a center with which I have worked for the last 25 years very closely. I understand that you only recently had a program with Dean Rochelle William of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, and we're delighted that we can work together on this topic. Well, I can think of three reasons why this program is so important. Number one, the topic is serious and it's very timely. Number two, we have three superb speakers. Dr. Sophia Chan is from Hong Kong, and she is the Hong Kong government's secretary for food and health. We also have Dr. James Curran, the dean of the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Many of you may be wondering, Ronnie, do you have a relationship with Emory? Well, 2014, when I visited the School of Public Health at Emory University, it was Dr. Curran that received me. I understand that Dr. Curran may still be associated with the Morningside Center for Innovative and for Affordable Medicine at the Medical School at Emory University, a center with which my family is associated. Last but not least, we have Dr. Ashish Jha. For a long time, for something like 16, 17 years, he has been a distinguished professor at the Harvard Chan School and surely one of the world leaders in preparedness and res in response on pandemics. So the three of you, together with your fellow professionals in public health, are perhaps today's most important people in the world. Finally, I can think of one other reason why this program is so important, because all three of our speakers are graduates of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. So ladies and gentlemen, sit up, learn, and enjoy. I want to thank uh, Dr. Sophia Chen, uh, Secretary of Food and Health here in Hong Kong for joining us for this discussion about the vaccine rollout. And specifically, I want to ask Dr. Chen about Hong Kong, but also maybe contrast uh, what is happening um, around Asia, maybe kind of from her professional um, uh, lens, uh, compare and contrast what's going on around Asia as well as the world. So, Dr. Chen, you are probably one of the hardest. You are one of the hardest women, uh, working women in Hong Kong today, and I want to thank you on behalf of uh, all of us. Um, this has been a tough year. Um, since uh, in Hong Kong, we kind of got it earlier than anybody else. Uh, we started hearing about it in January. So your life, all of our life have changed um, now for, for forever. Um, but can you tell us more about some of the latest development uh, with the vaccine rollout program in Hong Kong, which began um, in February? Uh, thank you, Alice. I think it's been a challenging year for all of us, and uh, but I continue to be proud to be part of this fight, you know, with the virus. Of course, vaccination is something that um, we have always been hoping for, and now we have it in Hong Kong. Uh, since, I think, the 26th of February, uh, we have... Um, uh, authorize, you know, two types of vaccine uh, for use, uh, for emergency use in Hong Kong. So we have started the uh, vaccination program. Uh, and ever since the past few weeks, we have been expanding the uh, priority groups. Uh, initially, we started with a few groups, including, of course, healthcare professionals and people working in the uh, uh, elderly homes um, and uh, people who are in critical services and so on. But most recently, we have... Um, 
uh, lower the age limit starting from 30 uh, to 59. And of course, those who are above you know, 59 are also included. So um, now the eligible population is about 5.5 million. Uh, that is about 80% of uh, people who are eligible above 16 of age because the two types of vaccine, uh, you know, one of them can uh, uh, only use for people who are above 18 and the other one is above uh, 16. So, uh, so far it has been uh, quite smooth. Uh, we have a total of um, 29 uh, uh, what we call community vaccination centers. Some are doing the uh, Sinovac vaccine. The other one is a uh, uh, Comanity net, uh, net, net, uh, vaccine, uh, uh, or we call you know BioNTech uh, vaccine. So um, we also have for for Sinovac because the um, uh, the uh, storage and also delivery is uh, less challenging. So therefore, it can be done in the uh, private GPs clinic. We have over fourteen hundred GPs with about you know two thousand sites that are also providing uh, Sinovac and also eighteen uh, general outpatient uh, clinics in the public system. Uh, for BioNTech, uh, of course, uh, in the uh, there there are a, uh, a total of I think uh, seven plus twelve, a, a total of uh, nineteen uh, community vaccination centers that is uh, providing uh, beyond tech. So, so far, I think uh, the latest figures, we have about uh, uh, 25... Uh uh, 250,000, uh, you know, people in Hong Kong already uh, been vaccinated. And of course, we hope the numbers uh, will go on. Uh, but that is only the first dose. We need uh, two doses. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, so far we have been uh, trying to promote the confidence of people um, in vaccination because, uh, you know, we it is voluntary uh, and we have a choice, you know, for, for people as to which uh, vaccine they're going to, uh, to get uh, in different uh, centers. But I think it is important for us to have um, public and also transparent uh, information about each uh, vaccine so that people understand uh, what te uh, technical platform they are in and what are some of the possible uh, complications uh, or side effects and what are some of the contraindications that, you know, in what condition that people shouldn't be taking uh, the vaccine. So all these are uh, transparent and we have a dedicated uh, website. Um, and of course, the most important is because the vaccine uh, development uh, is uh, still pretty new uh, because it has started its uh, R&D, you know, for, for about, about a year. And so therefore, uh, the, uh, the time frame of development and research is uh, really, really short uh, if you compare with other developed vaccines. So therefore, we have uh, developed a mechanism under the Department of Health uh, to really do surveillance of uh, all the uh, vaccine-related uh, adverse events so that we are aware of uh, the situation and that uh, we have a notification system by the uh, healthcare professionals. So all those are in place, but it is still important to get uh, people's confidence because with some of the cases uh, that they have got vaccinated, but because they also might have other conditions and uh, it happened that they um, they died or uh, in cases where uh, they have gone into the uh, intensive care unit, uh, people started to worry. Uh, but because we have a, uh, a clinical events uh, committee uh, of experts to look at, the most important thing is to look at whether there is any causality. So uh, the causality assessment is most important. And so far, uh, our experts have told us uh, publicly that uh, all these um, uh, adverse events, you know, so-called, uh, do not have any uh, relationship uh, or causality with the vaccination. Um, I think you talk about uh, the causality. Um, my concern, I guess one of the questions I want to ask you, what are your major concerns? Um, like you said, everything has been rolled out, you know, everything has happened so mm -hmm. fast and the development uh, mm -hmm. has been really, you know, in record time, mm -hmm. less than 11 months. Uh, and when we were talking to Professor Cowling, I remember our first program, uh, we thought it was going to be two or three years mm -hmm. to get a vaccine out and in, Hong in the world, in Hong mm -hmm. Kong, uh, really less than a year. So what are your major concern as, you know, our Secretary of, of Food and Health here in Hong Kong uh, with a vaccine rollout? I think um, the most important thing is really for uh, more people to get vaccinated in the shortest time, because uh, with the uh, prevention and control of the epidemic, I mean, we have been, you know, doing it for, for a year now. Uh, we have different wa waves and we have been successfully curbing, you know, some of the uh, some of the waves. We are, we are in the um, uh, <clears throat> tail end of the fourth wave now. But then 
I think vaccination is our hope because with more people getting vaccinated, the shorter time we can achieve a larger proportion of people getting vaccinated. That means one, that they are protected individually. Two, I think you know their friends, their family are also protected. And if we have got enough people, we can achieve a herd immunity so that the entire society is vaccinated. And with that, that not only can we control the epidemic with less confirmed cases and that uh, people's health and life are protected, but also I think we are about to uh, hopefully resume, you know, many of our daily lives and also our economy, as well as, you know, the, our travel, because many people are really hoping to travel, not only for pleasure, but also, I think, for business. It, in order for us to uh, revive our economy, I think, you know, some, some travel, be it across the border to the mainland or international travel is important. So I think the more uh, people are getting vaccinated in a shorter time, uh, the faster we'll be able to get our herd immunity, uh, the better we are in a position to discuss with um, you know other other places uh, for these uh, vaccination trans uh, passports or uh, or you know some uh, some negotiation um i think you you're uh, so right about the travel i think people uh, hong kong i mean people forget that hong kong is a, a small place um, we are a global city, and we're proud of that. But for for 7.5 million people, um, you know, it's really unheard of that in this last year or so, uh, we cannot even go across the border without uh, quarantine, and also, or even Macau. Yeah. And uh, and you re we realize how small Hong Kong is, mm -hmm. and the importance of trade to Hong Kong. Uh, but one of the things I also am I want to also um, kind of stress is how how well Hong Kong has managed uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Uh, 11, over 11,300, you know, over 11,000 cases, mm -hmm. uh, 203 deaths in a city of 7.5 million. And I'm contrasting this with Israel, which is uh, slightly more, they're, they're 8 point uh, over, almost 9 million people and 824,000 cases, over 6,000 deaths. So Hong Kong has really managed um, in terms of you know managing the the crisis or the pandemic really well, but right now I guess with a, a vaccine it is really about um, getting us um, traveling. But it's kind of back to normal a little bit. It, whatever normal is, we're going to have a new normal for sure. Um, so I think that is something that um, uh, Hong Kong um, is 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 working on. And one of the things that Hong Kong, what I find very interesting is having just registered myself, how easy everything mm -hmm. has been. The government in terms of uh, also getting the um, uh, test, the mm -hmm. go, you know, uh, yes. uh, right now, Asia Society Hong Kong, uh, in order to be open to the public, we qualify under a scheme. So every two weeks, uh, our staff, all of our staff mm. are getting tested and uh, my negative result came back Great. last Friday. Uh, so for us right now, the government has been very efficient and I knew it would be very efficient in rolling out the uh, a vaccine because again, very easy. Um, it took me less than five minutes to register. And uh, and they already have my second dose scheduled, uh, and I'm looking forward to to the, all the friends who have taken it. The mm -hmm. process has been very very seamless. I guess the question is about trust. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the the Hong Kong issue. I mean, it's not just Hong Kong. Almost every nation, uh, there is a lot of hesitancy mm -hmm. on the part of the the um, of the public because, like mm -hmm. you said, some of the technology, especially the uh, mRNA one. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Pfizer uh, uh, BioNTech one. It is a new technology. So how do you address that? Even informally, I've, I've asked friends and um, informal survey, 40% mm -hmm. of people said they are not going to take it and 60% mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. eventually take it. Mm -hmm. So how do you address that um, trust factor? I think, um, you know, trust is, is indeed, I agree, is a very important issue. And um, somehow, I think in the, in the, in the uh, past years, and. Uh, before the um, the epidemic, uh, because we have this uh, social unrest. And so the uh, trust on the government to a certain extent has been um, quite fragile. Uh, but we are gaining, uh, trying to gain the trust. But on this health issue, on this public health issue, I think, first of all, you know, people should trust science. Second, I think they should trust the experts. For the vaccine that we, uh, we have authorized for emergency use in Hong Kong, we have an independent um, expert panel uh, to look at all the data supplied by the um, vaccine manufacturer. You know, that is the clinical trials data, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And not only that, we also request
requesting you know, them to supply data to us uh, even after we have authorized them. That is, uh, after they have uh, gone post-market uh, data, we'll, our experts will look at it. So all the vaccine that we have now authorized for emergency use um, are safe, uh, efficacious and also of the required quality uh, as uh, recommended to the government by this panel of experts. So I think, uh, and, and also, you know, with these vaccines, uh, the benefits uh, actually outweigh the, the risks uh, that uh, we are exposed, you know, in, in this epidemic, not only in Hong Kong, but as you have already said, we're an international city. So we are also subject to the pandemic, you know, globally as well. Uh, although we are already having a very stringent uh, border control measures because we want to make sure, you know, all these new variants, you know, cannot, you know, go into the community. Even if they uh, happen to uh, come into Hong Kong because we are an international city, but we have different safeguards. For example, the testing at the uh, airport, uh, the um, uh, quarantine for 21 days uh, in the uh, designated hotel and designated transport and all these closed loop uh, quarantining that uh, we, we are trying to safeguard. So it is important that I think within the community that we get these uh, vaccines so that our, our life, you know, can our social distancing measures that I think, you know, some people are, are suffering, you know, can get back to normal. Um, I think on that note of you're right about, uh, you know, it's better to, ha to have the vaccine than not. Um, the Israel numbers, uh, I guess, in over 50% of the population, about 50% of the population have been inoculated with a second dose. And the preliminary results uh, from that is 98.9% effective in preventing death after a uh, second dose has been administered. Mm -hmm. So I found that number very, very encouraging. Um, so, so that is something that I think you're right about the science, getting the information out, it was gonna be a priority. But you touch upon the 21 day uh, quarantining <laughs> uh, and, and, and that when I was telling friends I was gonna be talking to you, <laughs> that has been the number one question. Um, so one of the, the, the question has been, you know, with a vaccine mm -hmm. uh, and, and many of uh, people are gonna take it, so uh, I think the, the comment has been, there's been a lot of stick mm -hmm. and is there enough carrot? For okay. example, if you get vaccinated um, when you travel, uh, you know, instead of 21 days, maybe 14 days or quarantine at home, is that something? And yesterday, I think uh, uh, the chief executive also mm -hmm. mentioned uh, that in his, uh, in his address to Lechko about possibility of some of the changes. Um, I know you probably can't tell us too, but I would just like to ask you about the 21 day quarantining uh, will there be incentive uh, right. uh, for people, uh, you know, as an incentive when people are vaccinated that they won't have to go through 21 <laughs> days of quarantining? Right. First of all, the 21-day quarantine uh, was uh, kind of like a new measure uh, that we have instituted uh, for about, you know, two months. And uh, that was really because of the uh, new variant that we have uh, uh, discovered. Not we have discovered, but, you know, there are, you know, new, these new variants from the UK, from Brazil and South Africa uh, and so on. And so we really cannot afford to, you know, to have these, you know, new variants, first of all, you know, coming into uh, the community. And spreading. Secondly, uh, I think uh, we have also tracked all our data. You know, for people who came in, uh, actually, uh, in our day 19 test, there are about 10% of people who get confirmed, you know, positive, even with the day 19. So we, at this, at this stage, we're bound to have uh, to keep the 21 day quarantine. But you are right about, you know, uh, vaccination, you know, what happened after vaccination? Can it uh, be relaxed or can it uh, be, be uh, some incentive, have some incentive uh, for people? Uh, I'm sure, you know, with uh, more people getting vaccination, this must be the direction. I mean, we, we must, uh, be able, hopefully, you know, with our experts with the more data mm -hmm. to relax, uh, for example, the quarantine, mm -hmm. uh, the testing frequency, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, even, you know, people are starting to talk about vaccination uh, passports, you know, that is, you know, traveling mm -hmm. or, or further bubbles. So I think this must be the direction. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I think, uh, first of all, we are looking uh, towards the World Health Organization in terms of their any uh, new information. Secondly, I think it's, it's also important globally because there are so many people vaccinating and there are all these um, 
uh, uh, information or data, you know, that um, the protection and also the infectivity uh, and, and all the uh, all these outcome measures of after vaccination, of post vaccination, that um, I'm sure, you know, many countries are measuring mm -hmm. uh, antibody, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think all these would uh, give us uh, more uh, confidence in uh, trying to work out a package or algorithm as to how uh, and when uh, we would be able to do the, all those uh, different uh, relaxation incentives and so on. So we are uh, actually looking into it and we are also consulting our experts. But I guess the question I have now is really about Asia. What is mm. your um, assessment or, you know, from your perspective, um, how Asia in terms of uh, is handling the vaccine rollout? And I guess specifically maybe even example, I know Singapore and Hong Kong mm -hmm. are ahead of the curve. Yeah. And what and, and China, as, as I said, they're they're going to you know they have big plans, but they they're being kind of realistic because their numbers are so so low, mm -hmm. almost non-existent in terms of their COVID numbers. So how about the other parts of Asia that you think are are uh, you know in terms of the what they're planning for the uh, vaccine rollout? Well, as far as I understand, for example, uh, some of the nearby countries, um, you know, Singapore, uh, Japan, and also Korea, you know, they have already started uh, vaccinated, uh, and uh, there are of course you know other countries in Asia that I'm sure uh, are preparing, you know, to do that because we know that with the uh, with more vaccine coming out, which we see actually uh, different platforms and also different brands are coming out. Uh, so I think the availability of vaccine uh, under COVAX uh, in under the World Health Organization is trying to have this uh, platform uh, to distribute vaccine to different, you know, countries. Uh, we have also joined, um, uh, but we are lucky because uh, we we are having a two prong approach. One is uh, we have joined Covax, but at the same time we are also negotiating with the different um, uh, different uh, vaccine manufacturers. And we are lucky now that we have uh, authorized uh, two types of vaccine. Uh, of course, um, I think we do hope. Um, that uh, more countries, uh, be it in Asia or globally, uh, will be getting vaccines so that, you know, the entire world uh, can get out of this pandemic, you know, as soon as possible. Hong Kong cannot be alone because uh, we are a global city. We will uh, ultimately be affected if the rest of the world is not um, improving in its uh, pandemic situation. So uh, we, we do hope you know, the entire world can be, um, you know, going towards the direction of, uh, you know, getting vaccinated and that we all would fight the virus together. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chen, for your generous time to this morning. I'm, I'm really grateful uh, for you spending the time with us and answering um, the questions uh, that we pose to you. And, uh, and I look forward uh, to welcoming you back. Uh, maybe when it's under less, <laughs> uh, less, uh, uh, you know, um, strains right now. But but thank you for all you do, um, and thank you on behalf of Hong Kong and and behalf of Asia Society Hong Kong for for your 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 dedication and hard work. It's been a tough year, but I think right now we can see. I truly, truly can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, because with a vaccine, uh, you know, rollout, um, and so far so good. Everybody has been the the the. The numbers look good. Um, I understand eightfold uh, in terms of the people who have registered um, because of the recent um, announcement of lowering the age to 30. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that um, those people who are interested in get it, getting the vaccine will do that. So again, thank you so much uh, for, for your, 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 your dedication and hard work. Thank you, Alice. And uh, thank you, Asia Society, uh, for providing this opportunity. And thank you, Ronnie. Thanks to Alice Mong, Asia Society Hong Kong Center Director, and uh, Dr. Chan for that uh, very insightful and informative discussion about the vaccine rollout in Hong Kong and in Asia. Now we'll be turning to the view from the United States, um, and leading that discussion will be our own very uh, Jonathan Karp. Jonathan is a dear friend and colleague, a former director, uh, executive director of Asia Society Southern California, as well as a former journalist with the Wall Street Journal and NPR. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Thank you very much, Charlie, and uh, welcome to our audience all over the country and Asia as well. I think Europe and Latin America too, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we, uh, it was great, Professor Chan's opening interview was a great setup for our conversation. We have two um, incredible experts, uh, Dr. James Curran and Dr. Ashish Jha, they are the deans of their respective 
public health schools at Emory for Dr. Curran and Brown for Dr. John. They also have been leaders in research on other viruses. Dr. Curran was an early leader at the CDC on HIV AIDS research. And Dr. Ja was uh, deep into the Ebola outbreak. So this is not their first pandemic, epidemic slash pandemic. Um, and uh, I'd like to start our conversation with uh, discussing the US um, and, then, and then segue to the global uh, outlook where we can, we can play off of uh, Professor, Professor Chan. Um, but as of today in the US, there have been 100 and nearly 116 vaccinations, shots. 22% uh, of Americans have had at least one shot. 12% have been fully vaccinated. Uh, two thirds of the population over 65 years old have had at least one shot and nearly 40% are fully vaccinated. So there seems to be an acceleration um, and progress um, as by and large the overall case rates are coming down too. So Dr. Jai, I'd like to start with you. Um, in response recently to a challenge on Twitter to write a happy story in four words, you submitted, quote, this pandemic ends soon. Could you elaborate on why you're, <clears throat> excuse me, could you elaborate on why you're bullish and to what degree do the COVID vaccines factor into your optimism? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me on. It is uh, always a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, come and speak at the Asia Society. Um, I've had the opportunity to do it both in Hong Kong and in Mumbai, and it's, a, it's just an honor to do this. So thank you, Asia Society, for inviting me. Now let me talk about that tweet uh, of mine from a few days ago. And I look, the, this pandemic will end. All pandemics end. Uh, this pandemic end will end, and in, in when I say soon, sort of begs the question, how soon? I think in America, life will get meaningfully better by this summer. Uh, and so for the United States, we are heading towards a very high level of vaccination uh, as early as May or June, and I expect there to be a relatively normal summer here. Uh, that's not the case for the rest of the world, which I know we will get to. Uh, so if your question is what brings us out of this pandemic, it is absolutely the vaccines. Uh, the, these vaccines that have been developed uh, across the board are pretty terrific, uh, and they will end up being our ticket out of this pandemic. Well, thank you. And actually, I, I meant to to note when I introduced you that, at, that this is you've already sustained a, a one grilling today at the House Foreign Affairs Committee. So Dr. Jha has, has had a very busy day. He testified um, uh, at for, on the global situation um, at the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Dr. Curran, do you share Dr. Jha's optimism? And given your long experience at the CDC and how you understand the importance of government leadership in public health crises, how would you rate the new administration? Well, I agree with Dr. Cha. As a matter of fact, I'd like to uh, borrow his tweet. I think it's terrific. Uh, and uh, optimism is not only warranted, but it's necessary. Uh, this has been the public health crisis of the century. There's been nothing like this in the last hundred years. Uh, and it's much worse than any of us thought it would ever be. Uh, on the, on the other hand, the scientific progress is much better than any of us could have predicted. Who would have thought in this short period of time, we'd have all of these vaccines that are effective and safe and available uh, already. Um, good public policy is based upon the best information available, a lot of transparency and action. You can't wait till all the uncertainties are done to act. And as a matter of fact, the vaccines, as we know it now, are the best way for us to return to anything like normal. Now, the important thing, of course, is that government is almost always uh, responsible for the health of the people living within the boundaries of their country. And it's extremely important to have government leadership, uh, government leadership in messaging, government leadership in uh, transparency, providing information, government leadership and providing technology and resources, government re leadership in balancing the economic issues with the public health issues. But it should all be based upon transparency, not uh, and, 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 and accurate information, not uh, diminishing one or the other. 
So government has a huge role to play. And I think in the countries in the small areas that have been uh, successful, uh, the trust in government, like in Israel, for example, has led to great success uh, along with the, you know, providing uh, the materials needed. Right, well, thank you. And obviously one of the key messages that the United States government has to get out right now is get vaccinated. Um, took a little straw poll of the uh, attendees at today's program on where they stand and over half have already started or completed the vaccine. About 50%, uh, 15, 1.5% have appointments. 32% uh, are waiting for appointments and less than 2% do not plan to get vaccinated. Uh, Dr. Jai, I think that's lower than what nationwide polls show. How um, concerned are you about this hesitancy and, uh, and how do we overcome it? Yeah, so uh, the, uh, if, if America looked like the audience of the Asian society, we would be in very good shape. Uh, unfortunately, that is not where America is right now. Um, so there are different polls and different surveys, but basically it's somewhere between 25 and 33%, between one out of four and one out of every three Americans uh, says that they don't have any plans of getting vaccinated. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, it's a problem. If we actually end up only vaccinating 65% of our population, uh, that is nowhere near where we need to be to really have the level of protection, population immunity, herd immunity, as people often talk about, uh, to really keep this uh, virus uh, suppressed. Uh, we probably need to be in the 80s, maybe even into the 90s. It would certainly help, uh, but at 60s, we're not going to get there. And there are a variety of factors. I think I am of the opinion that, that uh, some of that resistance will melt away. Uh, there's still some concerns that people have that these vaccines were developed very quickly. Are they really as safe as we think they are? Uh, and I think as they watch millions of their fellow Americans getting vaccinated and doing well, uh, I think some of that resistance will melt. But I also think there's a pretty more size, there's a sizable chunk of people who are going to be hard to convince and we're going to have to work on that uh, and engage with them because we need a large, large, large majority of people vaccinated. And at the same time that there's the public messaging, the science is progressing as, as you know, Dr. Curran. Um, it seems like vaccines can be, have been developed much faster than in previous uh, epidemics. SARS, for instance, I think it took 20 months to even get to the testing stage. And by that, by that point, it was the, the danger had passed. In this case, science is also bumping up against variants. I mean, how can you describe the, the challenge um, that, that vaccine developers and the public health community have in combating the, the, the different variants have, that have sprung up. For Dr. Curran is... Well, I, I think uh, th this means uh, adequate rapid monitoring. Uh, I think um, the available science would say that we can be preliminarily confident that um, all of the variants outside of the South Africa variant look like they're covered pretty well by the existing vaccines to which they've been tested. Uh, this process has got to be ongoing and it's got to be ongoing also in the community. So the people who uh, become infected after they're immunized, for example, need to be tested for the variants and they need to be monitored. Um, and the, the good thing uh, about even the variants that may escape this is that the facility by which the vaccines were produced has already encouraged the companies that are producing them to start to develop uh, newer vaccines or additional vaccines. So to some extent, they're chasing this already and monitoring it. It shouldn't slow us down in terms of the vaccines. This is one of the areas where <clears throat> it's very important to go with what you got and to, and to innovate as you move forward. And I agree with Dr. Shah about a lot of the hesitancy is sort of a wait and see hesitancy rather than the uh, ardent anti-vaccine hesitancy that we've seen with some of the uh, vaccines in children that are promoted by the anti-vaccine movement. I'm also concerned that vaccine hesitancy will be used as an excuse not to provide access. 
Uh, you know, we have access to information, access to information from trusted sources, and access to vaccines. So if people say, for example, that minority communities are less likely to want to be vaccinated, that gives us an excuse not to provide trusted advisors out there with trusted information. So access to information is very important. And then also we have to keep it up because as people see their partners and their friends getting vaccinated and being protected, that's a tremendous motivation. And right now we're still, uh, the demand is still well below the supply. And that gives us kind of a national excuse not to deal with hesitancy. Right now we're mostly talking about hesitancy rather than dealing with it. When, when supply uh, exceeds demand, then we have to really act. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, according to the CDC, um, 151 million doses have been delivered in the US as opposed to 115, 116 being administered. Um, so Dr. Ja, if, if I could turn to you on, on this question, the science seems to be there, uh, the policy is coming into shape, and now, as Dr. Kern's talking about, the demand, the access, we have the implementation. How do you rate the implementation of distributing the vaccines, of administering them in the US, and what can be done to improve it? Yeah, um, so the implementation, the distribution started off pretty badly. Uh, I would say December and, and much of January was not very good. We've gotten better. Uh, we've built up a lot more vaccination sites and we've uh, added more community health centers and other uh, places. And so right now we're administering about two and a half million vaccine doses a day. Mm -hmm. And I think we have the capacity built up that we could get to three or four million a day without a, without a problem. And if we can do that, that would be fantastic in terms of uh, getting a good chunk of Americans vaccinated. But I wanna go back to a point Dr. Curran uh, raised, which I think is exceedingly important. Um, we are confusing lack of access and lack of engagement, particularly within the African-American community with hesitancy um, and saying, I mean, just imagine, you know, going into the, uh, to the African-American community and see you're somebody who's new, who's a stranger, there's no really good access to care and showing up and saying, would you like a vaccine? That's not how this stuff works. You've got to engage with people who are trusted. You've got to uh, work with providers who are there, community-based organizations. It's also not overnight work, meaning you don't just show up the day before and say to the community-based organization, hey, let's go get people vaccinated. So there's a lot of work to be done to do this well. And that work needs to begin now because here we are in you know, kind of mid to later part of March, definitely demand outstrips supply. That's gonna flip in about a month. Um, mid to late April, we will have more supply than demand. If we're lucky, it will be May, meaning there's plenty of demand. Uh, but if we're unlucky, it could be early April. We have a lot of work to get people ready, that, that third to half of Americans who may not be readily excited to get vaccinated. We have a lot of work to get the, to get the vaccines to them. And one follow-up question to you, on As you mentioned in your testimony today in the House that, uh, and I didn't realize this, that variants make up more than half of the US infections. What which variants are uh, or or, or yeah. about that? Those about are about half. Um, and yeah, so it's the main one is B117. This is the variant originally found in, in Kent in the UK. Uh, it has been we've just been tracking it. It keeps growing and growing and growing, and you know it's somewhere around 40, 45 percent today, and I can, it'll be in before end of March. It'll be 90 percent of all infections, uh, and before end of March means you know it's not that far away, right? Um, and this is what is causing the, the plateauing of the cases in the US with about a dozen states now actually starting to see increases in infections. I, I think it's all driven by B117. It's also driven a little bit by relaxation of public health measures that's happening way too early uh, while still a lot of people are, are uh, uh, unvaccinated. So yeah, it's B117. I have to say, this is the one I worry about. I mean, people talk a lot about the South African variant, the Brazilian variant. I, they both have concerning features, but I don't know that either of them will end up becoming major problems here in the United States. Uh, they might, but I, I'm largely hopeful they won't. Right. Um, and Dr. Curran, as uh, Dr. Dra just said, that there's perhaps some premature opening. Um, what are the benchmarks you're looking for 
um, before the economy opens more, before there is a lot more indoor activity? Is there a particular metric or series of metrics? What does success in that regard look like? I think the major concern that a lot of us have is uh, that the combination of uh, COVID fatigue and, um, and political desires to open the economy and, and, and things like this will release the will reduce the mitigation efforts before the vaccines and, and other uh, types of immunity can really take hold. Now we know we're not there yet. That perhaps 30% uh, perhaps or more of Americans have already been infected with COVID and have some immunity and 20% uh, and of Americans have some vaccine immunity. Uh, there's probably some overlap there, but we're still less than 50% of people that have really any immunity. But even with that much, you can see we were able to have 50,000 cases reported per day. You know, the reported cases are just a small fraction of the total cases. So we've got a long way to go. And as we're vaccinating even three or 4 million people a day, it's not overnight. So the promise for the vaccine is a promise that's going to be in the future. We're going to get this promise, you know, fulfilled in the summer. It's not fulfilled now. It's not fill up the beaches and the bars in Florida, uh, take away the masks in Texas. This, this needs to be, they need to go together. Uh, my daughter and other people who work at the CDC call it a Swiss cheese type of, uh, of prevention mitigation efforts. And you can think of the uh, vaccine as a pretty nice piece of uh, almost no holes cheese, but it's only got 20% of the people. So you've got to have those other layers going and they have to keep going until we're up to 70 or 80%. Otherwise, we're not gonna knock this down as far as we want. And so we can't just say, well, let, let, let's relax mitigation and, uh, and let the vaccine kept up so, we're, so we can just keep it at a nice 50 to 100,000 a day. That isn't good enough. We're not going back to normal at 50 to 100,000 cases a day. So this depends on not just the people getting immunized, but the rates of infection going way down. Right. And that means that the vaccines need to be a, a real uh, stimulus to people to keep up the mitigation efforts, not to stop them. Like, oh my goodness, uh, you know, uh, there have been uh, 113 million doses. Let's go party. No, no, there's been 113 million doses. When we get up to about 500 million, then we can think about a little bit of a party. Right, and and Dr. Jai, you've you've talked about this too in terms of how to build more of a consensus um, on accepting a certain, on agreeing on a, a acceptable risk for, for the public. Do you see progress in that area? Do you, do you have a, a, a way to help that conversation? Yeah, this has been, this has been one of the most challenging parts of the whole pandemic. Um, I've spent a lot of time with governors and health commissioners from various states. And every single time case numbers start declining, there is immediately this push to, let's open up all the restaurants, let's open up uh, the bars, let's do what we can to get back to normal. And there is a conversation that we have about how much infection are you willing to tolerate? How much death are you willing to tolerate? And the answer, if, if you look at how people are behaving, the answer is not zero. People are willing to tolerate a certain level of infection hospitalizations and deaths. Um, um, oops, I don't know. Did, did I just freeze there? Can you still see me okay? Yep, you froze okay. for a moment. All right, so there's a level beyond which people really do pull back. So what I, I think what Dr. Curran said is exactly right from a public health point of view. The problem is even kind of more, more progressive governors uh, are not interested in listening to it. They're just done. And so I am trying to find a way to say, okay, you can't do what Dr. Curran wants you to do, which I agree with. What can you do? What are you willing to do? And the framework that I have uh, been using is to say, while I would like for you to wait until we get 70, 80% vaccinations, can you at least wait until all high-risk people have been vaccinated and have had a chance for their immune system to uh, benefit from that vaccination. I mean, you have to wait a couple of weeks after the vaccination. And that 
I mean, that gets us into kind of end of April into May before you start relaxing some of the public health measures. And, and what's very clear is that that doesn't mean that at that point, infections will go away. You'll still have a good chunk of people who are unvaccinated, not immune, and you'll still see some infections, but you should not see a lot of hospitalizations and deaths because people who are at high risk should be protected. And then of course we keep vaccinating and, and trying to get more and more people. So it's we're trying to walk a tightrope and trying to get people to hold off for another four to six weeks. It's a challenge because even here in Massachusetts where I am, our governor has declared that we're gonna have full, fully packed restaurants uh, as of next week. Right, and, and New York is going to allow spectators back at sports events. Uh, same in California, and at least in New York, the rates are, are, are going back up. Yep. Um, so uh, just to wrap up the, the, the US side of this, Dr. Kern, what do you see as the, the biggest risk right now um, as the vaccines roll out uh, to sort of keeping, keeping progress on track? I think Dr. Jha is right about the, uh, the wisdom of uh, prioritizing the elderly for the first set of vaccines, and in, in particular, approaching nursing homes. Uh, the, the nursing home situation in the United States has been a, a horrible public embarrassment, uh, with uh, 20, 30, 30 or more percent of the deaths coming out of nursing homes, which gives us a, an idea of how we treat the um, uh, disabled elderly in our country. Uh, and by prioritizing that, we've seen the first effect of a decline in admissions from nursing homes to hospitals by pri prioritizing vaccine. Now, what we should see in a scenario that um, Dr. Jha has promised his governor is that we sh should start to see a big decline in hospital admissions. And instead of having 85% of people in the hospital over 65, like we used to see, we ought to see hospital admissions only among young people or young people under 65. Now, we're not gonna see that exactly, but uh, we haven't really approached a higher, high enough proportion of the elderly until we see a really big drop in admissions among the elderly. And I think that that is feasible, but that should be one marker we should look at if we're gonna have that, that uh, strategy. Right, okay. so. Now moving moving to the big wide world. Um, obviously, the news from Hong Kong is encouraging. Uh, it's a small territory. Um, Taiwan is small. It's also got encouraging results. Israel is relatively small, and it's done a very good job of getting vaccinations out. So those seem to be bright spots. But uh, French President Macron today just imposed lockdowns from tomorrow on a number of regions and including Paris. It, the rates are going up all over Europe. So Dr. Jha, what's the, uh, what's the outlook for the broader world and how does that affect the United States? Yeah, it, this, is, this was the topic of the conversation at the, uh, the House of Representatives uh, Foreign Affairs Committee discussion for three hours. I'll give you my summary. Um, I, I, Europe minus the UK, UK has got a very different trajectory right now, but the rest of Europe or continental Europe uh, is looking like in some trouble. And it's probably, not probably, it is almost surely because of B117, that variant that we discussed earlier, the UK variant uh, is really starting to take off and we're starting to see big increases in, in cases. The, the sharp difference between uh, Europe and the UK or Europe and the United States is vaccinations. Uh, you know, the UK has vaccinated about 30, 35% of its population with a single dose. The US, as you said, about 22, 23%. Um, and most of these other countries are well below that. Uh, it's seven to 10%. And that means that they have a much more vulnerable population. And that's why they're getting into the trouble they are. And that's Europe, uh, which is, uh, got more access to vaccines than many other countries. Uh, there is a broader global problem that around vaccine supply and distribution that I think we are underestimating how difficult it's going to be. And whenever you find a problem with a difficult set of solutions, it's tempting to reach for easy ones. And so I'm hearing a lot of kind of simple talk of, 
if we just made the vaccine manufacturers give up their intellectual property all of a sudden, that would magically lead to billions of more doses. This is just a hard problem to solve, and I'm happy to get more into it. I'd love to hear Dr. Curran's thoughts on some of this, but it is a it, the global vaccination challenge is very substantial, but one that we have to rise to and meet. Uh, it is absolutely imperative that we get the world vaccinated, and not 20 by 2024, as some estimates have said. But of course, I'd like to have a majority of the world vaccinated in 2021. It's not going to be easy, but I don't think it's impossible either. Right. And so, Dr. Curran, the the floor is yours on, on your thoughts about the initial global response. I'd like to applaud Hong Kong and, and applaud uh, Israel and for their work. Uh, they're both small countries. Um, you know, Hong Kong is more the size of Manhattan than the size of Israel. And, and it shows that even in a very population dense uh, environment, uh, which hasn't solved all of its political problems, you can have enough discipline and trust to get things done uh, based upon science and, and protect the population from COVID. So I find it just amazing, as, as Professor Chan said, and, and what Israel's done has also been amazing. Uh, and I won't want to say anything more about Europe except to agree with Dr. Cha, rather focus on the issue of the world. So one thing that COVID has shown us is that viruses are globalized and uh, they can't be kept out uh, through any type of uh, immigration status or anything else that a virus can pop up and be around the world very, very quickly. And variants can pop up and be around the world very, very quickly. And usually we'll understand them better where there's science and money and resources. And that's true. Uh, that's what's happened in Asia, it's China and, and the wealthier countries in Asia. And it's also true in the developed nations. We still, to me, don't really understand what's going on in many of the countries that I was most worried about. I mean, I was thinking, oh my God, if this can happen this way in the United States, what's going to happen in Bangladesh? What's going to happen in some of the countries in, in Africa? And there's some very strange serial survey data coming out of India that makes you think that the transmission of the infection must be much worse than the morbidity or the data is not right. But I think we don't really know exactly what's going on in the rest of the world like we do in the country. So I'm worried about that. And I, and I think that it's true that we're not safe uh, completely anywhere unless we're safe everywhere. There are a lot of models for global vaccination. It doesn't happen overnight. I mean, uh, we're not gonna vaccinate the world by the summer. Uh, and we have to keep an eye on this virus and other viruses going into the future. But we need to have a global international commitment to getting it done. And uh, the vaccines have to be cheap, but that's only one small part of it. They have to be available, they have to be delivered. You know, they're going to have issues of trust and, and concerns also in their populations. And many of the populations simply do not have the resources. Now, one thing going for international vaccine distribution. And we saw this uh, a little bit with the Ebola outbreaks in Nigeria, is that the international vaccine networks that have been put together by the WHO over decades for childhood immunization that have brought childhood immunization rates up pretty high, have some talented infrastructure and talented people to help deliver vaccines in even the poorest countries. Vaccinating adults is always different. Mm -hmm. and, and getting this done in developing countries in a widespread way is different. But we have to get to know more about what's going on in those countries, really. And it points out the need for much better global surveillance and coordinated surveillance uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world. Uh, public health is always political. It should, in a pandemic, never be partisan or nationalistic. And of course, that's idealistic. But uh, idealism is the uh, half brother of optimism. Well, it shouldn't be nationalistic, but you know it is playing out in kind of a great game scenario with the various with the various donations of vaccines from China and Russia. And today, uh, the Biden administration announced that it would be sending two and a half million doses to Canada or to Mexico, one and a half million to Canada. Um, Dr. Jha, 
what can be done? I mean, are first of all, are the the diplomatic uh, efforts meaningful in terms of actually resolving this problem and getting enough people vaccinated? And how can the U.S. sort of step up its role in whatever global architecture is built for the for the uh, COVID effort? Yeah. Great question. So um, there is a global architecture for getting vaccines out. We heard from uh, Professor Sophia Chen actually about this, uh, and that's the COVAX facility. Um, and I think America has already committed under the Biden administration in playing a role, and I think that's a good thing, and they should do more of that. Uh, in my mind, there are two sets of uh, opportunities for the United States to have a leadership role. One is certainly by May, I mean, so, sorry, certainly by June or July, but even by May, uh, we will have a, an excess of vaccines. Uh, we're going to have plenty of vaccines. We've got 30 million doses of AstraZeneca sitting around. That's the 4 million that we're giving away. That still leaves us with plenty, then, and we can make more. And we should make more. And we should give it away. And we should give it away. Uh, we should probably give some chunk of it to COVAX and then some chunk to countries uh, where there may be hotspots or real need where um, uh, the vaccine would do a lot of good. So in my mind, that's one part of America's strategy is keep making vaccines and giving them away because we are we have enough now kind of bought and going to be delivered to vaccinate every American three or four times over. We don't need that. Second is we need a global effort to ramp up vaccine production. And this is much, much harder than it looks. You have to find facilities that can actually uh, produce vaccines. The one key point that I want people to walk away with is vaccines are not like pharmaceuticals. You can't just, these are biologic agents and they need a lot of very careful work in order to make them reliably and safely. And it's gonna be critical that we engage in that. So there is a, there's a, a, a real opportunity for US leadership to ramp up vaccine production, but that's gonna take a lot of work in finding raw materials, finding people who can actually build vaccines, uh, people who have the technical know-how, a lot of complexity not unsolvable, but it's gonna, it's not gonna happen on its own. COVAX isn't gonna be able to do it. WHO won't be able to do it. We'll require national leadership from pres President Biden uh, or, or another uh, global leader. Thank you. We're almost out of time, but I wanna extend it a, a little longer to get to some of the audience questions. So I hope that's okay with um, our speakers on the East Coast, it's getting late. Um, Asia Society audiences are typically global travelers. And so we have a question about that. Um, and it's for either one of you. Uh, do you think that showing proof of vaccination will become mandatory um, and the norm for future travel? Can you think of any reason for exceptions to this if it were implemented? I'm happy to start. Uh, I can imagine I've already we've already heard from some CEOs of uh, major um, airlines uh, that for long haul flights, they are going to implement some sort of a vaccination requirement. And, you know, I actually think about the fact that I probably used to go to Hong Kong twice a year um, until obviously the pandemic. Uh, and it's a 16 hour flight from Boston to Hong Kong. It's a direct flight. And I would feel much, much better spending 16 hours with you know, a couple hundred people that I don't know if I know everybody's been vaccinated. So building confidence back in global travel, I think will require it. And I do imagine that a lot of airlines will, will uh, ask for it. Uh, obviously harder to do when large chunks of the world isn't vaccinated and can't get access to vaccines. So do you require it? And what do you do with travelers who are from in countries where vaccines are not readily available? So there are gonna be some challenges and it may be, there may be a transition period but I can imagine vaccinations could end up being a pretty important part of global travel. I think that it falls in the, in the general category of will vaccines be mandated for X, Y, and Z? Will it be mandated to work in a hospital? Will it be mandated to um, uh, attend a university? Will, will international students need to be vaccinated to come to the US? Uh, will students come to the US if they find out that it isn't mandated for other students? Will parents let their kids live in residency hall, residence halls if uh, people aren't vaccinated? We are, aren't even quite wrestling with this enough from my point of view 
in part because of this supply and demand issue. And, and also the vaccines are still available under emergency use authorization. So until they're really licensed, right. it's hard to really mandate them. But I think there's gonna be a lot of pressure uh, uh, for people to be vaccinated under a variety of conditions, including travel. Uh, and there'll also be a lot of incentives for people. Um, many universities, including ours now, will be requiring people to be tested every week. And of course, all the sports uh, organizations, people get tested every week. Um, I can see that if you have been vaccinated and can prove it, the frequency of testing may go down. Uh, now that doesn't mean it's mandatory exactly, but it does mean that you know you have your choice between getting vaccinated or getting a nasal swab once a week for the, a long time. And, and, I, and, and I don't know how it's gonna play out. The, the problem with mandates is that they're discriminatory, uh, just like prioritization is discriminatory. And when you start to discriminate, you have to ask yourself whether it's honest discrimination or not. Um, you know, are you saying only, when you say only certain groups of people can do something and then you look at the groups who are disqualified, you mm -hmm. find that there are often disparities there by race, age, educational status, access to vaccines, insurance status, a lot of things like this. So that I think it's important for people to start to wrestle with this issue now uh, both the positive incentives for vaccine and then the negative incentives for not being vaccinated. But I, like Dr. Shah says, there's some inevitability to this. The other thing is entry into countries. Right. I, I'm not sure Hong Kong is going to want Americans to come visit too often unless they've been vaccinated. They don't have any cases. They don't want to introduce it into a, a city with uh, seven and a half million people in a very small place where spread could happen very quickly. Thank you. And last question, and each of you can give a quick answer to this. Um, and it gets to the to the issue of global collaboration and possibly overcoming some of the nationalist feelings and um, and co collaborating on a scientific level that may or may not have happened in the past. The question is, is there an effort to buy and run trials of the Russian vaccine in the West so that there can be another sort of Western approved candidate if it's shown to be effective. That goes for China, the Chinese, the Chinese uh, vaccine as well. I mean, has this been done before? Is it worth a shot? Yes, yeah, a good question. So a lot of uh, countries in, in Africa are starting to now use the Russian vaccine. Uh, the Russian vaccine has not gone through any kind of regulatory approval, well, outside of Russia, at least, that I'm aware of. The EMA, uh, the European Medicine Agency, has said they will evaluate it on kind of a rolling basis. I'm not sure exactly what that means, right. uh, but it is absolutely essential in my mind uh, that the vaccine be evaluated much the way that the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, Moderna, J&J, uh, &J, AstraZeneca have all been. Uh, that's going to be a really critical part of this. I don't know that we need to run another trial. We might, uh, but what I do know is that the data that underlies the reporting has not been made public in a way that would um, uh, need to be made in order for these things. But maybe just my last point, there is now gonna be a flood of vaccines. And one of the best ways of creating hesitancy in my mind is not, make, is not going through a careful regulatory process on each of them to ensure that all the vaccines that get out there are safe and effective. Uh, that's probably our best long-term ga uh, game plan for helping people feel comfortable about these vaccines. And I'm deeply worried that a lot of vaccines are getting out there without that regulatory evaluation. Uh, that's an excellent point. Dr. Kern, would you like to? The only thing I would add is that the days of the randomized controlled trial with, uh, with uh, placebo recipients are close to being over in the United States, except for children. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was a, actually a vaccine trial participant myself in the Moderna trial. And the idea that people would go in when you know you can be immunized with a safe vaccine and volunteer when you might get a placebo could will, will be considered unethical in, in, many, in many areas and won't be allowed. So there have to be ways to evaluate vaccines, to evaluate the existing data that have been shared, but also different types of of study designs to look at equivalency rather than to, to look at uh, 
placebo controlled trials. Right. And, and, and moving to countries where there's no vaccines to doing those trials will also be thought of as uh, globally unethical, I think. Right. Well, I'd like to thank you both. Um, this has been excellent and uh, I've learned a lot. We appreciate your time and your expertise. And so I'm gonna end with my four letter story. You both were superb. And there's a three word epilogue. This story continues. So with that, thank you. And I'm gonna hand it over to Hong Kong, Alice Mong. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ja, and thank you, Dr. Curran and uh, uh, Dr. Sophia Chen. Um, I am really delighted to, to uh, be here. And, uh, and as I said before, just got my first uh, vaccine uh, yesterday and I am looking forward to traveling uh, when I can get back to the States to see my family. And, uh, and I wanna again, thank the, our wonderful speakers and uh, Dr. Chen, um, who uh, is, is, you know, uh, we'll, we actually uh, interviewed her yesterday and we have an extended um, a program that we will put on Asia Society Hong Kong website for those of you uh, who are interested. She goes into more details about what's happening here in Hong Kong and some of the plans. So please check out our website. And I want to thank Dr. Ja. Uh, it's great seeing you again. And uh, even though it's on in, you know, in Zoom again, last time we saw you, it was episode 18 in July. And I really thought uh, when we started this series on our COVID update, it would be um, a short term, maybe a six month project. Little did I know that a year later, uh, we are here on episode 28, as Ronnie has mentioned earlier. And, uh, but I know one of the key thing is really to get to know from the experts. And one of the things that Dr. Kern addressed is really about the uncertainty. If we can help address the uncertainties, that certainly is a public service. So I wanna thank Dr. Kern uh, for being here and we look forward to welcoming you to Hong Kong in person. Um, in the near future. Been there. It's a great place. I know. I will, well, we look forward to walking to Asia Society Hong Kong for a program like we had with Dr. Jot when he spoke at Ebola a few years ago. So we look forward to traveling again. So thank you um, to our wonderful speaker and the staff. It's been a delight for Asia Society Hong Kong to collaborate with our Asia Society um, uh, Southern Cal colleagues. It's been, uh, this is one thing that um, I think a positive side of COVID has brought the Asia Society family closer together in terms of our program planning. So it's programs like this that we are able to bring you um, globally. So I really wanna thank Lee, uh, Angeli, and Charlie and my staff here in Hong Kong for making this program this morning possible. And look, and if you like what you're seeing, please support us by becoming a member of Asia Society Hong Kong or Asia Society Southern Cal. Uh, we really need your support. All the programs we've brought to you this year, um, we, it's, been on, it's been mostly free online. So please join us in supporting uh, Asia Society Hong Kong and uh, the global family if you'd like. And I want to also um, kind of uh, end on talking about the upcoming programs. I think uh, we right now, I know you can see some of the program that's coming up on your screen uh, that LA will be doing. And here in Hong Kong, episode 29 uh, will be coming up uh, in a few weeks in earth, for the first part of April. Uh, a conversation with Professor Manfred Green talking about the Israel experience. Um, Israel has already um, kind of vaccinated over 50% of the people. So a lot of lessons to be learned from Israel. So join us in April when we have an opportunity to talk to um, uh, Professor Green. And on that note, I wanna again, thank all of you for joining us this morning here in Hong Kong, uh, afternoon and evening in, in the US and really stay safe and, and thank all of you for being part of the Asia Society global family. Good morning and good night. Thank you.